do is um, help women who, how I like to say, basically who cannot stand next to a chocolate cake without wanting to roll around in it naked. We have those situations where, um, you know, for many, many people, food is just not an issue. But if you've ever had those situations where you feel sad, mad, glad, happy, any emotion basically, in fact, and you turn to food as a way to drown out what you're feeling and replace it with a, another feeling which is uh, way more pleasurable because let's be real, chocolate. Chocolate. It's usually chocolate cake cookies, <laughs> right? Sweets of any kind, but some of us are also more onto the savory, crispy types of things. But, you know, these are the women that I work with. And um, the way that I sort of found my path was I did this sort of my um, underlying training is in that health coaching sort of um, genre. And that's where I started out. And then I had a fabulous group of girlfriends who actually pulled me aside one day, some other business associates, and sort of said to me, you know, we get what you're doing. We're feeling the vibe, but I feel there's a little there more for you. I don't think you're being authentically and honestly yourself with your, with your audience. They said, you know, we know about your history with emotional eating. We know about your history with yo-yo dieting. We watch you and the way that you eat and the way things are very sort of, we can tell these are trigger points for you. And we just basically are calling you out and want to say, if you're going to do it, go all in. And that is exactly what I did. What I decided to do was to turn the thing that I was so ashamed of into my brightest shining star and let that my, what I used to consider my menace become my message to the world and let other women know that there's nothing to be ashamed of. Not only is there nothing to be ashamed of, this is so common. Everybody at some stage turns to food to fill an emotional need. So it's it's a way for me to sort of put it out there to go, this is real. It's not, you're not crazy. The fact that you really feel like chocolate does have a Wi-Fi connection to your brain is is true. It's real. And these are things that we can deal with. <laughs> exactly. You know, given the right tools and implementation strategies, it's all it's all deal, you know, deal deal withable is a new phrase for us. But it's all, I don't want to say fixable because you're not, <laughs> you're not broken. Like this is, it's very normal. So that's sort of how I came to be on the, on the journey and the path that I'm on. Cool. Okay. So tell us just a little bit more about, about your history in terms of your history with emotional eating. Like was there, was there a trigger for that? Was there something that set it off or was it a response to something in your life? Like how did you, how did you come about um, in terms of having what is now your brightest shining star, how did it become your menace to begin with? Yeah, and it and you know that is so true. What you say there is so on point. It was my deepest, darkest secret and my biggest shame for all of my life. Um, I you know I always say I dealt with emotional eating for thirty years. This is not like a little skip through the through the daisies and then I was out of there sort of thing. It was my whole entire life. And it started from as far back as I can remember. So it's not like, um, you know, some women may be able to pinpoint a certain time in their lives when they can say, well, when I was in my 20s, um, you know, my partner left me and I started emotional eating. No, I was as small as sort of two years old. And I used to stuff my face with chocolates until I was ill <laughs> and um, like physically ill. And you know, I can't, who can know why those sorts of things would happen? You can't know. All I know, all I can know for sure is that I was certainly quite a little sugar fiend from a very young age and there was no off switch for me. Enough was never enough. So it started from very young childhood all the way through, you know, into teenage years and then adulthood. Um, it was just food was my everything. There was no other way that I felt with that was acceptable to cope with feelings I just turned to food and but for the longest time for the longest time I didn't even know what I was doing I didn't realize realize what I was doing I did not put a a name to the action it wasn't like I sat back and went oh I'm emotional eating again all I knew was that I felt as though I was the world's the world the greatest loser in the whole world the biggest failure because every time I felt something I couldn't stick to any diet and every time I was sad or upset or anything I was stuffing my face and I just all I knew really internally was that I was enormous giant failure and that's the feeling that I went through my entire life with I was not good enough I could never be good enough 
And so the vicious cycle continued. I would soothe those feelings with chocolate, hate myself even more, stuff more donuts down my face to relieve those feelings, and on and on we went. So, you know, as I say, it's, it really is a very challenging situation for so many women, which is why it's so incredibly important to know that you're not alone. And not only are you not alone, it's, it's very normal behavior. We're, we live such stressful lives. So that's pretty much um, how it rolled out for me. It's about being authentic. The more we run around trying to hide ourselves from the world, and in fact hide ourselves from ourselves, we can't bear to actually look at what is going on with us, the harder we try, the more ashamed we feel of who we are. We're human beings and we are women. Like, let's be real. We're so super awesome it hurts, but we have a lot to deal with. We do. <laughs> you know, exactly. Like, raise a hand. It is true. And, you know, we are incredible and we, are, we have multi-talents and incredible gifts and so much to share with the world. But as long as we are squashing that down and feeling ashamed about things that we shouldn't feel ashamed about, it's all a mindset anyway. It's only your perception of what is and is not acceptable that allows you to show certain sides of your personality to the world. What if we all stepped up and said, this is this is me, this is who I am. You got something to say about it? I really don't care anymore. It's more important, eventually I decided, it was more important for me to live my fullest truth than for me to pretend to be acceptable in society's eyes. And of course, I mean, you know, you, you're not suddenly unacceptable. What you will find is that the deeper you step into who you are and become, allow yourself to flourish and become all of who you are, the more at peace you feel in your body, the more at peace you feel around other people and the more people are attracted to you because you have such an incredible message to share and you're the bold one who's not afraid to share it. That's where I think the power lies. Um, I can certainly give you some contrast as to what my day used to look like compared to now. So how it used to be before I stepped up and took ownership of my own life, my day would start with my eyes popping open, me being instantly disappointed and disgusted in myself because of what I had eaten the night before hating my body, shuffling to the bathroom, um, analyzing myself in the bathroom mirror, jumping on the bathroom scales, be again being revolted by what I saw and the number that I saw on the bathroom scales, completely unacceptable, would send me into a whirlwind of self-hatred and I was off to the shop eating donuts and, you know, just, just sort of making it through my day until I could get back home into clothes that I felt comfortable in, like, i.e. tracky dacks, <laughs> track pants and slippers, because I hated everything else that I, I had to wear when I was in society. <laughs> you can't really wear your track, <laughs> track pants everywhere. And I hated all of it. And so all I wanted to do was get back home, get into my sort of stretchy, comfortable clothes and eat chips. That's what I did. Now, now um, that I have ditched the diet and ended the self-sabotage and the torture and the, you know, beat, beat the binge, the whole thing, right? Now my day is very different. Now when my alarm goes off, I set it very early in the morning at 4.45. And that might not be very early for everyone, it's early for me. 4.45, it goes off each day. I start by immediately looking at some intentions that I have written out from the night before about, and when I sort of say intentions, um, I would clarify that by saying how I want my life and my day to look for that, you know, next 24 hours. So that might be, I am energetic beyond um, all stratospheric possibilities. You know, my life is incredible. I am ridiculously happy and full of energy. And I'll have certain things listed out. I read them before I'm even fully awake. And then I'm on it. Out of bed, um, the first thing I do is a very quick meditation visualization sort of session. Throw the headphones in, sit in my comfy chair, and, you know, do this for sort of 10, 15 minutes. I, I do some early morning um, yoga or just stretching. I mean, really, I like to say yoga because it sounds fancy, but I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I'm really just stretching. <laughs> stretching, right? Um, and from there, it's, you know, I'm just powering forward. So I make sure I get a daily workout in. Um, I, again, spend some time to sort of journal or write out my intentions. And why? What's the importance of that? 
Well, I can tell you again, I have discovered without that, without making any kind of me time first thing in the morning, for my sort of personality, I would always just launch straight into frenzy mode, which would lead me into overwhelm, which would lead me to turn to food for um, some comfort, some, some time out, and as a reward, because I had freaked myself out by trying to power forward through the day without taking any time to get my head straight, that I would, if I wasn't turning to food through the day, I would, for sure, by evening time, be stuffing my face. <laughs> And I didn't mean to, it wasn't like my intention when I get home, I'm going to stuff my face. It wasn't like that. It never is. You start very intentional. I'm going to have a cookie and a cup of tea as a treat, we tell ourselves. But um, I can tell you, treats are for dogs and we deserve to be treated and loved in all capacities at any time of the day, right? That's super important. So um, just making sure that you've got your headspace right first thing in the day making sure that you take time for yourself at all stages throughout the day. So I don't just go, here's my 30 minutes in the morning and now, bam, I power through and, you know, sometimes I do do that and I can tell you it doesn't end well. It does not. It will usually end with too much food consumed in the evening when you finally dial it down for the day. So, you know, the number one thing that I really, that I do and that I would highly recommend is making some what I would just call me time for yourself in the morning, get your head in the game. And then if you feel throughout the day, like you're getting overwhelmed, just, this is what I do. So I'll go ahead, do, do my work, but then I will take at least, at least one, preferably two more sessions throughout the day for a breather, a five or 10 minute meditation, a visualization, writing out my, some more um, sort of intentions and affirmations in my journal. If I'm thinking, I am totally freaking out, like this isn't working and you know you're, you're losing that headspace, you're getting out of the game, you've got to get back in. So I'll write out a few things again. I am full of energy, I am calm, I am in control, like, and you just write, pick, even pick one, write it out 500 times, then get back to whatever you had to do. That's what I do and then of course, you know, by evening time, I used to work very, very late. Sometimes I really try and avoid that now because, I've, again, I know my triggers and I think this is so important for women, you know, whether it's an emotional eating gig or whatever it is, whether it's um, alcohol consumption or something else, you could know your triggers. We've got to get savvy about this. We can't, this isn't somebody else's problem. Nobody else is going to write in on their white, you know, there's no Prince Charming. He's going to write in and, and make everything. That's a Disney movie. That is not real, right? Real life means you got to step up your own game and take power, take your own power back and take control. So I had to learn my triggers. How do you learn them? By observing your behavior. The next time you do stuff your face with chocolate, you just look at why and bam, there's your trigger. So next time you will know to pay attention when those situations arrive. Um, but that is pretty much it. And then by the evening, I make sure that I make some more time for myself to read and relax and me I'm a bit of a neat freak so I I like to make sure all the you know it's very important for me to have the house in a reasonable state before I trot off to bed um, because I don't want to start again it's all about the triggers I don't want to start my day again the next day by walking into a room full of chaos like washing dirty dishes everything from the night before that again will freak me out I think it's very important that we um, act and act accordingly as women, step into our power, understand that we do have the right to ask for things that we need. We're, you know, this is a society that is fully supported in that way. So it's very important for us to step up if step up if there's a need that's not being met and you're not able to meet it yourself, ask for help. It's not um it's not doesn't mean you're weak. It means you're smart. You're smart enough to know where and draw lines up to what you can and cannot realistically achieve and expect from yourself and then call in the troops for everything else. That's, that's pretty much the way I see it. And this is what the diet industry has done to us. As women, we have these ridiculous standards set for us and I, I have said this so many times that I'll just throw it out there that 91% of women hate their body. And, you know, this statistic is just way too high. And the reason we, we have this self-hatred is because we've got these unrealistic expectations set for us by the diet industry, 
you know, the the amount of women that actually have that Victoria's Secret model body is only 5%. So we're like killing ourselves to try and look like the minority, like what I like to call very lovingly, the genetic freaks of nature are these women. Yes, that's fabulous. They're fabulous and they're stunning, but so are we. We don't have to look like somebody else or be somebody else to be awesome and fabulous. You have your own brand of fabulous, and that's what we want to be enhancing. So, you know, I hear you. It is all about stepping into your power and owning your own gorgeousness instead of twisting yourself into like a salted pretzel to try and steal somebody else's awesomeness. It was never meant for you. You're not going to get it. It's not yours. We want to embrace and empower ourselves to step into our own awesomeness. I think there's two really important things, and one of them is that understanding that um, running your life entirely by your feelings, you're never going to get anywhere. Or you will. You will get somewhere. It just might not be a place where you want to be. <laughs> but um, I think mindset is the number one thing, number one thing to pay attention to. And this sort of almost sounds like um, it's a bit of a sort of, I don't know, juxtaposition that's sitting side by side, but, but and it's, it is still super important to pay attention to our feelings. So if I don't feel like it, I have to really analyze and just go, listen, am I just being a little lazy today or what is the deal? Because, um, you know, I will get my head in the game by thinking about what is required of me, what is required of me to be able to live a life that I'm proud of and who is relying on me today. Um, there's many, many things that you can do. But, and, what I say, but, and, if you're literally actually physically exhausted, then I would honor those feelings, which, and that happens from time to time. Sometimes the alarm will go off and I'm super, super tired. And I think, okay, if I'm going to push myself forward now, that will not be honoring my body and my needs and requirements right now because I am really tired. And in that case, I would let it go, you know, until I feel that it's okay now. I'm going to get up now, 20 minutes later, half an hour later, whatever. Get the sleep because otherwise if you're too sleep deprived, you're just like powering forward, powering forward. Well, you do that messes with your hunger signals. So that's, again, that's not going to be helpful. How is that helpful? It is not. So, um, you know, but mainly and always it is a mindset gig. This, you know, the whole thing that we have with our own motivation and getting our act together in our lives and whether we make progress or success or whether we don't, it's the, you know, the my, it's the beginning, the middle and the end of the story. It all starts up here. So it really does start for me with being very intentional. I, I don't just run my day by how I feel. Um, you know, I can't run it by, you know, well, I, I don't, I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that. I mean, we're not two years old anymore. We've got to decide. <laughs> what kind of quality of life you want for yourself. If we're constantly just caving to our feelings, you're just not going to live a life that you are really fully happy with and in love with. So as I said, I'm very intentional about the steps that I take. So again, with those, um, I have electronic you know, reminders and intentions on my phone. It's the first thing I do is I look at those and I read them out loud. I read them and I read them out loud. In First thing initially to get my head in the game. Um, that is what I do for motivation. And well, and then and also, I, I'm a big music fan. So I will jump out of bed and throw on some really cool music loud. And does it mean I feel like dancing about or do it? No. Sometimes it makes me more grumpy for a second. But I don't care. I'll do it. I'll do it because I just feel like it's so important to shift. If you're in a negative place initially, um, you got to shift it. And as we said, it's your responsibility to do that. So use any tool and trick that you have in your fancy basket of, tri of tricks. Do whatever it takes to shift that energy because it is just, it is an energy. It is an energy. It's not who you are. You don't, um, you know, you d you're not sad or depressed. You generate sadness and depression. So because of that, you have the ability to change it, but you have to do something. Just sitting around eating Oreos going, I'm so sad and depressed, isn't going to shift that energy away from you. It's only going to exacerbate the situation. So that is what I do. I'll use any tools, tips, tricks, you know, put some funny, whatever, put something funny on the TV. If you watch TV, I don't know. I don't watch a lot of TV, but um, music is a big one for me and writing out if I'm not feeling it, I'll start writing it until I do feel it. And you don't just write out 
lines of I feel great, I feel great. You've got to write them, feel them, write them, feel them. That's the tool that I use and find to be the most powerful to keep my, keep my mojo high for each day. What would I do differently? I would, I'll give you some words, like, you know, the words that come to me, what would I do differently? I would be bolder. I would be so much braver. I would not be ashamed of who I am, but I would embrace every part of me. Instead of trying to hide myself away and only show the parts that I felt were acceptable, I would show all of myself. So, you know, nothing risque there. <laughs> nothing too risque, but I, but I would. I would expose it all because... Um, because that, you know, your life is your message. It's not, you don't just have a message. You, you are your message. Your life is your message. And um, if you try and sort of hide any part of that away, then you can't, you're not being authentic. So, yeah, what would I do differently? Among many other things about, like, not just not procrastinating or wasting time because of fear, I would step out there boldly and just say, what is the worst that could happen? What? We act like it's going to you know, kill us if something doesn't, you know, succeed the very first time. And most things don't succeed the first time. That's how you learn what works and what doesn't and how you're going to move on from there. But no, I, I, my biggest recommendation and, you know, my biggest, it's not, well, it's certainly not a regret because it's all a learning phase, but it would be to step out boldly and bravely and don't, don't be afraid of what other people are going to say or not say about you. They're going to talk anyway. You could be instantly at superstar status. Status. They're still going to talk. People are always going to gossip. So it doesn't matter. You might as well be authentically you. And at least when you put your head on the pillow at night, you know you gave it your best. You gave it your all. You know, I think that is the number one most important key. Oh, God, I, I, this makes me almost a little teary. That's a bit weird, isn't it? For me, the biggest challenge that I over, have overcome was uh, my marriage breakdown. So, you know, that was not a whole lot of fun. That came to me out of the blue. I was <laughs> completely unprepared. <laughs> Obviously, my voice cracks out. Because, you know, I mean, these things are never easy. But, um, I yeah, I was completely unprepared. So that took me by surprise. And so, therefore, it was quite a shock to me. And I think... You know, this it was a very challenging time, um, and you know now I'm very fortunate because um, he and I get on fine. We're you know we're best friends. We see each other all the time, so that is an ideal outcome. But it doesn't always end like that for people. And you know, one of the biggest lessons that and challenges that I sort of learned from that was, um, well, really, what I had to decide to do was not to be a victim, but to step up and take control of the situation. So. You know, it was just how it was for me. I had decided that um, if things were going to be the way that they were, I was not going to um, beg beg or plead for them to be otherwise. That's just a decision I made from the start. I stepped up and said, okay, I fully appreciate that this is what you need to do for your life. On your bike, off you go. <laughs> That's fine. Here's what I'm going to do for myself and my life. So I, um, I made a list and I was very fortunate that I had a great support network with my family. So we sort of talked all this through and I thought, all right, how can I switch my thinking on this situation? Instead of it being the greatest disaster of my life, how can this be a greatest, um, you know, not necessarily a win, but how can this be a stepping stone for me to take myself and my life higher not something that's going to crush me down keep me stuck down here for six months or six years or however long people stay stuck there I was very quick and immediate I didn't waste any time I mean you know it was a small period of grieving but then it was like no well this that's enough of this it's time to move on so I um, decided very very quickly what I would and no would and would not um any longer tolerate from myself and from anybody else in my life. <laughs> so that meant certain people had to go and other people I drew closer to me. Um, and I really stepped up my, what I like to almost call a code of conduct for myself. It's like, I will not be, um, the, and I may, you know, I have lists. These are the things that I, behaviors and ways of talking and being that I will accept from myself. And here's the 15 things that I will no longer tolerate. These are out, right? Out of here. And that was a very powerful moment for me. It gave me permission 
to not be all um, wussy about this situation, but instead just see it differently. You know, it is what it is, but the power that it has over you is all completely dependent on how you view it. So I took that moment, decided that this was now an opportunity that not many people get in their lives. I now had an opportunity for a fresh start. I had a blank slate. And the choice of where I went from here now was completely mine. And that was very empowering for me. So it was at that point that I stepped up, started my business, decided this is what I want to do. This is who I want to be. I'm not going to ever again do a job that I that I hate. I will only do things that I'm very passionate about, work with people that I love, um, create a life for myself that I'm fully aligned with and that I enjoy because there's no reason now to do anything otherwise. There was literally no excuse. I don't have children. So there was nothing else to consider as far as that went. So that is how, you know, the method that I really use to turn what could have could have been um, something that squashed me down for months and months or maybe years into an empowering moment for myself that took me to where I am now, where I just love my life. Love. Oh, um, self-belief, self-belief, 100%, thinking that I wasn't strong enough, I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't good enough, I wasn't talented enough, I wasn't skinny enough, I wasn't pretty enough. I mean, where do you want me to end, right? Um, it goes on and on and on. The voice in our head that says, oh, that dream life, that, that thing that you want, no, no, that's for other women, that's not for you. You need to sit over here very quietly and, and don't speak out. Oh, don't go for what you want. No, no, that's not for you. That's for other women, the women that you admire, but that's not for you. You should stay down here very quiet. Just squash yourself down here a little more and feel really, really crappy about yourself so that you don't even try and do anything, you know, that could actually make you happy long term. God forbid, right? And um, <laughs> no, it's the thing that has held me back, the thing that has held me back, let's say it's like I want to shout it, um, has been myself. The thing that held me back has been myself. And it was a very revelational moment when I really actually realized that. And I thought it's really quite sad. But also, again, empowering because that means if I was the one that, that was doing it, then the choice is completely mine to switch that out. And I, I just decided I would no longer, again, it's like as part of the code of conduct, I would no longer not do things that frightened or scared me just because I was, you know, maybe scared that I would be embarrassed or um, not look good in front of other people. Who cares? I did something just ridiculous the other day on um, a Facebook Live. I sang and danced. Me? Am I a singer? No. <laughs> Am I a dancer? <laughs> no, certainly not. But it was a very empowering thing for me because it was my way of saying to myself, okay, just because I'm not a singer doesn't mean that I shouldn't sing. It also does not mean that I should repeat it time and time again. You know, I don't want to deafen people. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a way to say, listen, I'm doing something that makes me feel really, really good and you should too. You know, this is not about putting ourselves into a little box and making sure that we look acceptable at all times to people. If something brings you great joy and you're not harming anybody, it's all right. It's all right. So, yeah, the number one thing that has that held me back and I'm sure holds many, many of us back, it's not an external situation or circumstance. It's what you tell yourself about the external situation or circumstance. It's always you. It's always you. Number one thing would be to know that you're actually okay exactly as you are. You don't need to torture yourself, restrict, deprive, count calories, macros, points, anything like that to try and become someone that you were never meant to be. Does that mean that you need to put up with and accept a body now that you're not entirely comfortable in? No, not at all. It just simply means that there are ways to get there that um, are not going to hurt you and torture you, you know, mentally and physically long term. Um, as I talk about, you know, in the boot camp with the girls, yeah, the, the average weight loss with girls that I work with is, you know, depending on how much weight they have to lose, anywhere between 5 kilos and 25 kilos over, you know, as, as little as a short week. Um, six week short period but you know so yes weight loss is possible I just think it's very important to understand that 
trying to restrict and you can't hate your way to happiness. You can never hate your like thank you. You can never hate yourself so much that you will now initiate long lasting change. Looking in the bathroom mirror and despising what you see is not going to um, bring about any kind of love and permanent change. It, it, the game, as we said earlier, it starts in the mind. The weight loss will come once you deal with the, in, the external changes once we work with, on the internal. The external, it all melts away once we look at the internal. That's the shift. That's the difference. And that's what I think is really important.